maturity and what mature companies do differently from non-mature ones. Right, so I'll be joined by my colleagues Alex in a bit, but this is what we'll talk about. What is that data intelligence thing actually? What are the key results that we found in the study? What is our own journey on that data product? And what is uh, next? These things always, okay, they work. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm gonna take you back in history, very briefly, don't worry about it because I don't know much about it then either. But we're gonna look at organizations, right? Many of you are in companies and governmental organizations. And organizations have always learned to master assets in some way, right? So in the beginning, the 1700s, now we have steam engines, which allows for a whole set of different new companies to be created, right? The industrial age, if you will. And then the, in the 1800s, we elect had electricity. So you didn't have to put coal and stuff anymore and have a lot of smoke just to get some machine going. And then in the 1900s, we're getting closer to today, right? Um, in the 1900s, computers started to come up. And you've all seen those pictures of the computers as an asset. Physically, used to be this big thing. Uh, and then it went smaller and smaller. And now, the computing power that fits in our pocket is just beyond belief, really. So if you fast forward in time a little bit, and now we're going to the time when we actually start to be alive as people in the audience, right? Uh, then you'll see that in the 70s, organizations are really now using these computers to master those assets. And they started with the everything asset, if you will, the ERP system, you know, the, the materials, the products, the subproducts, the processes, etc. That was, at that time, the system of record, the system of engagement, as Felix called it this morning, um, uh, that companies started to use with giants coming out of there like SAP and Oracle and many others. And then in the 80s, they started to expand to other systems of engagement. For example, HCM or human capital management. And it's a little bit impolite to call that an asset because we're talking about people, right? So, but let's call it the talent asset for the time being. And those HCM systems are all about, okay, how do we allow people to book holidays and manage their um, uh, schedules, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the 90s, uh, Mr. Siebel popped up and he came up with the CRM thing, customer relationship management, which companies were doing before the systems actually came into place, right? They had contact lists and so on and so forth. But then they said, let's put a system of engagement in place, the CRM, and that will be the main system through which we drive our whole commercial organization, right? And that was the CRM systems. And Siebel uh, had one, and then there were others, of course. Um, and an interesting thing happened then around the 2000s. I looked it up uh, on Wikipedia, so maybe it's not fully correct, but it's sort of correct. But around the 2000s, many of those systems of engagement for the money asset, like an ERP for the talent asset, went into the cloud. So fundamentally what they did is they took those systems of engagement, like an ERP and a CRM system, with a fully defined list of capabilities. You know, you sort of know what you want from a CRM system. And essentially all they did is re-architect those systems and put them into the cloud. And that's already happening in the 2000s. And I know that some of your organizations are still very hesitant about the cloud, right? But chances are, that your ERP, that your CRM, and many of or your other systems of engagement are already in the cloud for one or two decades, right? Now, in 2008, Colibra uh, existed. I should have put a picture there of like the founders, and then you would see how um, naive we were at the time. But anyway, we were started in 2008 in the financial crisis. Um, and then what happened, so this is giving us a little bit of a more close view on the market as to what happened during those years. Uh, and what we started to see was that the era, if you will, of the data asset started to happen around the 2010s, including that being taken into the cloud with the snowflakes, the big queries, and so on and so forth. So now all of a sudden organizations start to feel comfortable to take all their data and put it into uh, those cloud uh, platforms. And the chief data officer also came up, right? So that was a real example that organizations started to take that phrase data as an asset, a strategic asset, seriously, 
right? They assigned a leader in the organization who would be, quote unquote, the boss of that asset and figure out how to make that asset work for the organization. And that's more than just, oh, I'm storing it, storing it in a database or moving it in an ETL system, right? That's really thinking about the value of it and where it comes and who manages all of that. Uh, so there's a whole uh, series that we can do on the chief data officer during those 2010s. But really where we are now is the 2020s. The chief data officer went from, I don't know, 10 or so people worldwide to over 20,000 today and still growing. And my prediction is organizations will continue to master the data assets and that will be driven by some sort of data boss which is likely to be the chief data officer. So I would say that in the 2020s, this is when the mastering of the data asset is really coming into fruition. And we call that with Colibra data intelligence. And as Felix mentioned, we are that system of enga uh, engagement for the data asset. Now, you can believe me all you want, uh, but maybe I'm wrong. But I'm basing my opinion that it will happen in this decade, the maturity, on the 15 years we've been in the market. So we see how fast or slow this sort of goes in the market and in the change in organizations. But we're seeing a number of drivers in the market that will continue that trend that's already ongoing for 15 years. And there's four of them. So there's obviously regulatory drivers, which is when it's, why it started. That's how the CDO role started. Um, so there was one regulation in, in financial services. Uh, and then in 2016, you started to see GDPR pop up. And by now, there's over 200 regulations worldwide that are just about privacy. And next to that, there are other data-related regulations, like, for example, the Data Act, or in the US, the federal government, they recently came out with something around AI. I forget the name now. Right? So there's clear regulatory drivers that force organizations to think about data as an asset. Right? Um, security, the same thing. There's just more and more data breaches. There's a beautiful visualization on uh, informationisbeautiful.com or something like that, and it shows bubbles. So you'll see that over time, there's more bubbles, more data breaches, and the bubbles are also getting bigger. More data is getting stolen. And it's getting stolen from the biggest organizations in the planet with the deepest pockets and supposedly the best engineers. Right? So if it can happen to them, it can happen to everyone, which means that Again, more demand for the data asset to make sure that it's not just according to regulation, but it's also secure in your organization, which essentially is a risk game against attackers, whereby you never want to be the easiest target, right? You always want to be one step ahead of them. Then there's organizational drivers. Organizations Kaizen or do process improvement, uh, six nines or sigmas. So there's all sorts of wonderful things. But as soon as they set a process in place, Organizations tend to want to improve that. Show me the metrics, show me the value, how can we do better? So they're going to do the same thing with all processes related uh, to data. Obviously, you'll get competitive pressures, pressures. Let me give you the best example, right? So imagine that you're an organization who has given every one of their employees a phone, like this, an IT asset. So now all of your employees, all of your colleagues can use that asset to do better, to be better at their job. And imagine that your competitor does not have that, right? Then they have a weak spot. Then they're not using the full power that they could be using. The same thing is true for data. If you don't properly master the data asset and your competitors do, you're going to have um, a problem. And of course, there's new data roles popping up like privacy people and so on and so forth. Data engineers, data scientists, analytics engineers. And obviously, uh, another driver in the market is technology. AI drives more demand for the data assets. The Internet of Things makes sure that, you know, over time, maybe even water bottles start exhausting data. So more demand for the data assets. The cloud, same thing. And even the blockchain, which is a little bit of a weird disruptive thing, maybe five years out from now, uh, will also drive more demand for data. So there's clear trends in the market that push organizations to be better with their data, which means that organizations have to uh, figure out how to do that. And we call that data intelligence because we have a lot of partners. You heard that this morning uh, and they have you know, better warehouses and better ways of moving data and so on and so forth. But that doesn't necessarily, moving your data faster uh, or computing it cheaper doesn't necessarily make your organization more intelligent 
on data. To be intelligent on data, you need to connect that data to the right people. You need to have that context around it, and it needs to be connected ultimately to the business outcomes. And you're going to hear me talk about that until, you're, until I'm blue in the face, but you need to have that connection from the data to the value. If that's not present in your program, if that's not present in your strategy, you know, not this year, but maybe next year, that might be uh, an issue. So now over to the study. Um, so the white paper, you can see it down there. Again, can recommend reading it. Uh, but essentially, the biggest thing that we saw come out of it is if you classify organizations on level one, two, three, four, level one being the least mature in data intelligence, level four being the most mature in data intelligence, then you see that the ones that are most mature, level four, are actually achieving three times the business benefit than the non uh, mature organizations. And that's very simple. One is learning how to deal with the data assets. The others are more proficient at it. So it's normal that they get better at their job. Now, this data, I'm not going to, uh, I know that we're all data people and we like a lot of data, so I'm not going to bore you with my beautiful pie charts and bar charts. But essentially, the demographics that we did in the study, that IDC did, is all over the industries, all over the different countries and regions, all over company sizes, and including different levels of data roles. And then when they looked at, let me go back because there was a, there you go, take a picture. It lasts longer. Um, so um, these are the four levels. And these are, ba these are not imaginary levels. These are actually based on the survey results that they gave us. And then we categorize them uh, as follows. And you'll see that only 10% of the surveys consider themselves to be uh, mature. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but it's worth it. And the subscales that uh, were considered in the survey were these six. So you have data intelligence management, the stewardship, all that stuff that you know a lot about and will learn a lot about here today. The culture of the organization. You know, is your boss actually questioning the reports that they're getting? The data catalog, of course. Governance, we know that very well. Quality, you heard Kirk talk very excitedly about it. He can talk about data quality a lot longer than I can, and he knows a lot about it, so listen to him. And then the measuring of the data itself. And I've summarized some of the results. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, but in four categories, you see the difference again between the level fours, the leaders, the ones who are more mature, and the laggards, the ones who are still trying to figure it out. And a few things, right? You see that 45% of the level four organizations have a CDO, whereas the others have not. So if there's no boss of the data asset, then the organization is still going to struggle a little bit to get everyone to think about data as an asset. The objectives, you know, level four are more thinking about effectiveness of their data scientists, of their analysts, of their data citizens, whereas the others are more security uh, regulatory oriented. Expectations, 248% more level four organizations always demand that data intelligence. Like you get data and you're asking, what is the context of that data? How can I interpret it? Where, does it came, where did it came from? Who is the owner of this data? As so you're asking for it. That's what you should instill on all your colleagues and your bosses that they start questioning data that they receive. And then technology, where the level fours have adopted more uh, technology capabilities than the others. So these are just made for screenshotting. Uh, so please feel free. Uh, but essentially, I'm going to go through a few of the subscales a bit quicker uh, to make sure that you have some sample of what the, the results are. But again, you have to read the whole report to really dig into the meat of this uh, study. But you can see here on all these charts, I'm colorblind, so I, I can't really help you. But some of these, some of these colors indicate the, the level four, some of the uh, colors indicate the level one. You see how the 95% 90, have Im implemented security, privacy, and governance solutions, but only 10% of those have implemented all the cataloging functions. So even if you've embarked on a catalog journey, you're still learning as an organization how to use it to your uh, best advantage, right? So you're all in that journey together. Learn from the ones who are at the same stage uh, as you are and learn from the ones who are maybe one stage ahead of you and learn from what worked from them, but also learn from what did not work for them. 
The data culture, you see that um, there's a, a big difference here. How the level four organizations, all the way at the bottom there, that 54% uh, chart, there the level fours are really using uh, the data culture, really trying to influence it, which I think is really important. Whereas many of the lower level ones are still, you know, maybe only talking about it rather than doing something about it. Data cataloging, uh, similar uh, that as we discussed before, you see how nearly 70% of the level four have implemented all the data catalog capabilities. And remember that was only 10% of the population, whereas none of the level one organizations have implemented all of the capabilities. So they're looking at this catalog and they're clicking some buttons and trying it out and maybe having some data sets in there or some metadata, but they don't really know fully yet how to spread this to the whole organization and enable that marketplace so that consumers can quickly find uh, the data. And of course, we make new features all the time. So we're trying to stay ahead of you in those new features that you can then use later down the line. Data governance, is, which is something we've been doing for a long time. And you see how the majority of the level fours again have implemented or believe they have implemented most of the data governance processes, whereas Again, the level ones have implemented, none of them have implemented all of those processes. So they're really getting started. Um, data quality and observability, um, another one. So you'll see uh, Kirk talk about that a lot more. But again, the level fours do more things better from a quality perspective than the other ones. And then you can see how they get ahead, right? Because their data products have better quality going into them. So the decisions they make, the, the, the efficiency of the models they produce is just going to be higher because their quality of data is higher as well, which is very logical when you think about it. And then last but not least, uh, the data measurements. Again, at the bottom, four times as many level fours have seen improvements in the, in the metrics compared to um, just a few of the level ones. Now, these are some results. Like I said, I don't want to bore you with all the data and all the details in this session. That would be uh, a little bit too tedious, but read the report. Um, and now we'll talk about how you can actually get started to increase your uh, data intelligence maturity, how it works. And we're going to share that from our own viewpoint in Colibra's data office. And I'm going to start with something that I told you I'll talk about until I'm blue in the face, always connected to the dollars. Right? So we'll be speaking with Barb from MIT Sloan later, and she talks all about data monetization. She surveyed hundreds of organizations out there, looked at their data programs, and looked at what made them work, and how you can set up certain frameworks uh, to actually set um, a data monetization strategy in your approach. So monetization, think about it, and that's not just selling data. If you said it to Barb, she gets really annoyed, right? So don't think about just selling your data. Think about maybe efficiencies, improvements, etc. And then the essential part to getting that monetization done is to think about data as a product. And I think with this wonderful quote from supposedly a smart guy or a smart ass, uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Alex. Tell us how um, we figured some of these things out ourselves at Calibra. Stan, test. And uh, thank you, Stan, for going over this. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex Zanner from Colibra's Data Office, and very happy to be here on stage in San Diego and see you all here. So how do we see this in practice? Because Stan has been talking about monetization, monetization but how do we get to monetizing the data asset? That's the question, right? In practice, we see that for business stakeholders, data products are the shortest conceptual distance between the data and the dollar. So that's important to know here. Data products are key here. So what do we have to do? We have to go full speed ahead on creating those data products. But that's not trivial, right? We can say, OK, build them, but we need a well-oiled data product machine to do that. And to have a well-oiled data product machine, we need processes. We need the right people and the right technology. So let me walk you through here a data product on how we are seeing this. So this is a data product. And if I'm correct, when you entered the room, you got like a kind of paper 
with a QR code. This is a data product. And this helps you understand where you are standing in your data intelligence journey. So where are you standing? Are you just at the very beginning or at the very end and maturing very well? And this, uh, you can do that by, by just answering a couple of questions. It takes five minutes of your time. All right, this is a data product. But how do we get to build this? And building that is key because remember, we want to go over that good, well-oiled data product machine. And for that, we need a process. This is the eight step process for creating data products. And where do we start? Here, identifying the business ask. So we start there because data products, me as a data scientist, like that's fun to build, right? Like everything that's machine learning and getting more into the weeds and getting more technical, that's all very exciting, but that's not important. Like the business need is important. And then we can get excited on building them. So if there is a business ask, we can start the process. And only when there is a business ask, we start that. And that's a data cataloging process. And that happened a couple of months ago, where my colleague Antoine Chauvet asked me, hey, Alex, can you build a benchmarking data product? I said, of course. What is the business value? He said, OK, I have for all my customers here and prospects, I want to show them how, where they are standing in their journey and how they compare to their other peers. Perfect. So that's our business case. Next step. The next step is something which we learn at Calibra here. That's defining the product owner. And that's a governance step, right? Why do we do that? We have to set somebody, at least set that somebody, somebody in the business is going to be responsible for this data product. Somebody we, which we will collaborate with because they know what they need, right? So we have an owner assigned. Then we go into our data office team and we prioritize, okay, who's going to work on it? What resources, what technology do we need? That's a prioritization step. And that's more focusing on the culture. Like that's really building that culture in your organization to have, again, that well-oiled data product machine. Next is my favorite step here. So we are here iterating the prototypes. Because when you're building a data product, it's never a one-stop shot, right? Like you have to really collaborate with the business in creating this. Because they're going to ask in the very beginning, I need this ABC. And at the end, it's going to be something a bit different, right? Like, we have to evolve that. Evolve with them, show them a demo. And then they are going to say, oh, I'm missing this and that. And it's only by doing that that you will get to something which is really helping them and which is going to be consumed. Next, we create a data product after the iterations. We add documentation, which is a cataloging step, which we all know, right? Like we need proper documentation. What is this data product about? And then this is going to be linked to what is it doing? Where is it coming from? What is the value? We finalize this by publishing it and also promoting. And promoting is something which is very important here. Because if nobody knows about it, like there is not going to be usage of your data asset, right? Last step in the process is monitoring. You don't only monitor the quality of the data that is getting in, that's, that's important, but also the usage of the data product. Is it actually being used? Now you have, okay, it's being used, perfect. But you also have the possibility that it's not being used. That is kind of sad as a data scientist where uh, nobody using this and I thought it was cool, okay. Um, but what are you gonna, gonna do then? Just be sad? No. Two options, or you sunset it and say, okay, let's call it a day and we don't waste resources anymore. Or a second option is an enhancement request. So meaning, okay, you go back to the owner, say, okay, I've built this for you. Um, what else do we need to do to make sure it really fits your needs? And then we start again, and this is a life cycle. We go over this multiple times in the, in the stages of creating data products and having them around in your company. So it's really important to really master this process well. Summary, this is a data product I just walked you through, but we have many in our organizations, right? Like many dashboards, many um, uh, machine learning uh, models that are out there spitting out the predictions. 
And here on the right, we have a wheel. That's our eight-step process. Okay. Every time that we're going to create a data product, like sometimes in the beginning, in the very early stages, you're going to forget a step. Oh, there is no owner. Oh, I started too quickly on this, on this project. Or oh, creating it and the iterations are taking too long. Hmm, not good. But you're learning from your lessons, right? And you really are building that data product machine together with the business. Like, you create them for them, right? Never forget that. Not only because it's cool. And here, you have the company. Like, the bigger wheel is the company. The small wheel is the data product machine. Meaning, every time we do one run and create a data product, the bigger company gets one up. And every time we do that, we are going to go quicker and quicker and quicker and learn from the lessons. And that bigger wheel, the organization, is going to go up and up and up and up and up and go better and better and, like, you really become proficient and you get to your well-oiled data product machine so that finally you can monetize your data asset perfectly. Over to you, Stan, for a good conclusion. Thanks. Thing. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I made Alex put that uh, cogwheel image in uh, and I hope it's clear, right? Every data product, every cycle you follow, your organization inches a little bit up on the data intelligence maturity scale because the owners are now more confident, right? The catalog is now more complete with a recently published data product and so on and so forth. So that small process on one data product really shifts the gear of the whole organization. We've seen that in practice. Thanks for sharing that, Alex. Uh, the main takeaways are here for you. The data asset will continue. You've seen the trends in the market. But the reasons why doing it are clear. The business benefits three times as many. And monetization and data products are the how of how you get that bigger wheel spinning. And with this, let's open it up for some quick questions. Any questions? Thoughts, comments, concerns, tomatoes? <laughs> yes. Um, well, there's uh, definitely uh, the blockchain is a mechanism for trust. Although, if you look at uh, you know all the fraud and um, the scams that are happening in the space, it doesn't feel very trustworthy uh, in 90% of the cases. But it does have some advantages as a technology. Uh, so where do I see it? A few years ago, we started tracking it because you know people were saying, okay, we're going to put our data on the blockchain and we're going to create oracles that we can call out to. Um, and I think it's an interesting technology still. But it's way too early for it to be a topic that comes into companies uh, from a governance angle. At the moment, you know, most organizations are still struggling with data warehouses and self-service BI. So they may have blockchain initiatives, but that's not reaching the governance. It's more the, the, the piloting stage, for example, or in specific uh, businesses. But it is a topic that I love to talk about. Um, even though it is a little bit of a hairy topic at, in stages. And in a five-year time frame, it might be disruptive because what happens with the blockchain as a technology is it fundamentally uh, allows for a different model of ownership. So, for example, take any social network uh, provider. We all use some of them, I assume. Um, and they say that the data is yours, right? You can always say, hey, delete my profile and give me all my data. But ultimately, that data does sit in some server or some file on machines that they own and pay for, right? So you can you know, call on your rights to delete the data, but they own the machines. You don't even know if they did it, right? And I think that's because they own the databases. And what's happening with the blockchain technology is that it allows the databases to be the network, right? So you connect to the network. And everybody has a copy of the whole database completely encrypted, right? So you can't do anything with it. But that fundamentally shifts the ownership model, right? Because now the data sits in the network and the social media provider or the bank or whatever connects to that network just as you do. 
And if you say, I don't want my bank or my social ne media network to have my data anymore, then you just turn off the access key, the encryption key, and they can't access it anymore. So fundamentally, it's a big disruption. But in practice, I think it's going to take a, a number of years, at least five, before we start to see this percolate through in organizations, if at all. Right? Because with all the scamminess around it, it may become too dirty for organizations to actually touch it. So we'll see, 50-50. Um, you're welcome. Other questions at the end? Shout. You know, yeah, along the lines of um, blockchain and uh, immutable data, really, with Kafka, immutable logs, microservice, microservices, and there's no longer one source of truth. How do you, what are your thoughts on Calibra and governing the complexities of that, that microservices architecture? What oh, you mean there's, there's no longer a single source of truth? Is that what you said? I don't think there's ever been one. I think the single source of truth is sort of like the, um, you know, Don Quixote and the, and the windmills kind of thing. Uh, people always try to put their data in one place and then they have another place in which the data sits, right? So from our viewpoint, uh, whether that's, you know, with data warehouses or feeds or streams or microservices, we consider that the data is always going to be in multiple places and batch or real time or whatever. So we sit on top of that landscape no matter what the technology is. Hope that helps. And happy to follow it up, of course, including the other topic. Uh, last question. Well, there's two. Okay, two last questions. So you demonstrated how you create products for new data sets. Yeah. Can you guys tell us about your experience with applying that principle to existing data products? Uh, you mean to say there's already a Tableau dashboard out there somewhere, and yeah. now you want to sort of bring it under governance? Right. Um, well, that's, that's more of a, um, a retrofit, if you will, right? But with our catalog software, you can connect directly to the Tableau server, for example, and pull those out. And then you can follow the trusted business reporting process. Some of my colleagues actually present this at the boot uh, down there in the stages. Um, and you say, okay, now we have a list of all the reports, data products that are out there in the Tableau server, and then you can start prioritizing them somehow, maybe based on how much they're used or how valuable they are, and start to identify, okay, which one of these has owners? Um, and which one of those are so important that they need extra scrutiny on the quality level and on the lineage level, for example. So you can bring existing things under the process as well. But I think maybe sometimes it's easier to start with a, with a new one. Uh, you're building data products all the time, your organization, right? There's analysts building dashboards all over the map. It's just a matter of getting them on board to follow that really simple process, essentially. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. And the last one, there was a last one somewhere in there. Is that you, Rajesh? Okay, this is going to be a difficult one. <laughs> uh, so, Stens, my question is about, like uh, you mentioned, about small wheels drive the big wheel and yeah. the data product. So, like, uh, how does the organization today measure the success of having these data products? What are the metrics that they define? What are the metrics of measuring success of a data product? Yes. Uh, well, fundamentally, there's a number of ways that you can measure it, but I think fundamentally it has to be measured in a dollar value, in a, in a value amount. So you, you do that through measuring, is it actually used, as Alex said, right? It could be the most beautiful dashboard with like really crunchy pie charts in there. I love pies, I hate pie charts. <laughs> um, but essentially, uh, if nobody's looking at it, it's like, does a tree, when a tree falls in the woods, does anybody hear it, right? So if it's not being used, if it's not being looked at, it's definitely not valuable. Uh, it means that you probably forgot to think about that owner step in the beginning. So you just excitedly build something, but there's nobody in the business to actually use it or change their business process because of it. So it's useless. And then you can go further, right? Are they, when they're using such a dashboard, are they actually making a decision based on it? Right? Are they taking an action based on it? And then how many people are looking at it? So there's a number of ways that you can actually measure how successful a data product is, but ultimately you need to tie it back to dollars. And I think Alex, uh, last year we did a blog about that, how you can actually do that. So maybe we can share that one. Thank you. That was the last one because uh, there's probably other sessions you have to get to. But I really, really want to thank you all for being here in San Diego. And thanks for connecting and sharing with one another. See you later.